Welcome to our Visual Trends panel here at OFF Conference in Barcelona. I'd like to thank everybody here who's attending live and say hello to all of the Facebook Live attendees. We are going to be discussing as a panel today the multi-localism visual trend. My name is Brenda Millis and I'm the head of Creative Services and Visual Trends at Adobe. I help Adobe build their stock collection to always be forward-looking and leading edge through research around where interest is scaling around visuals. To that end, I do spearhead the visual tr trends forecast every year at Adobe. And I think to start our conversation today, what would be great is if I kind of define and give everybody clarity around what visual trend forecasting actually is. Um, Visual forecasting is a combination of research practices that can actually predict where audience interest is growing around very specific visual topics and visual styles or aesthetics. And this kind of forecasting helps creatives and Adobe clients basically strategically move forward with um, the image choices they make or the images creatives create with insights around where interest is scaling visually with an always growing audience. So today we're going to talk and focus on as a group, um, we're going to talk about the trend called multi-localism. I'll give you an overview of what is considered multi-localism imagery and then I'll situate why we've chosen this topic and this trend today here. Multi-localism visuals reflect, reflect a growing interest in two kinds of imagery. Imagery that reflects local authentic experience as well as imagery that conveys multiple cultural references, a pastiche if you will, of cultural references within a single image asset. I'd say that multi-localism imagery uh, reflects changing styles of living and working in multiple places. It also reflects our need for new experiences and adventure. So multi-localism trend is also reflecting a melting pot of influences and experiences for a growing number of global artists, many of whom have a lot of different cultural ties, whether because of where they were born and now live, or where they now work, or many places around the world where they're working, as well as multiple international design influences. We are definitely seeing a huge influence of multilocalism in both advertising and fashion internationally. And today in our group discussion, we'd like to address how we as creatives and thinkers are responding to this trend at this time. So a very specific roundup of multilocalism and why multilocalism is uh, scaling in interest gives you an idea both of what, both where and why interest is scaling around this so you know not just which kinds of images are multilocal, but to give you some cultural context. So it's really the fact that travel and technology have made the world a much more accessible place and space for more and more people that has made a growing audience for cu many cultures. And more and more people are, as more and more people become interested in many cultures, we're seeing that reflected in style, in interest, and very much in identity, personal identity. A growing interest in many cultures then is what's responsible for a growing interest in these types of images. Again, local and authentic experience and multiple cultures seen and represented within one image. Many of us now think of ourselves as simultaneously local and global citizens. So why multilocalism here today? We think that this visual trend very much reflects the very nature of off as a conference as well as reflecting the attendees here. I'd say more than 60% of the attendees range in age from 18 up to 30 and have come too off from all over the globe. I'd also say that there's a huge span in creative expertise and background from filmmaking to illustrating to any type of design. So now that I've given you a brief overview of multilocalism, my role in visual trend forecasting, I'd like to open up the discussion to our great panel.
and we're going to explore how multilocalism is tied not just to art, but to technology and to the actual evolution of visual culture. Toby? Hi, I'm Toby, Toby Shinobi. I'm Senior Content Creator at Havas Chicago, and i um, here to talk to you about multilocalism. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mariana. I'm an illustrator, and I'm also here to talk about multilocalism <laughs> with you and Good thing. my experiences <laughs> with it. So I'm Dr. Nelly Benayoun, and I'm a designer of extreme experiences. So I guess I design volcano in your living room, dark energy in your kitchen sink, sonic boom in your bathtub, <laughs> and um, you know, like you mentioned, I mean, I, again, you know, really a variety of background. You know, my dad is from Algeria. My mom is from Armenia and I'm born in the south of France and I've been pretty much traveling everywhere. Um, and then, yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Percy. I'm a freelance illustrator and character designer now living in Hamburg. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Mitko. I'm a photographer and art director and I live and work in Paris. Hi, I'm Rudy. Uh, I'm Flemish, Belgium, and I currently live in Istanbul. So I'm a futurist and I also do a lot of work with children now to design the futures. Thanks, everybody. So to begin, let's discuss a bit about representing local experience. Um, to convey authentic local experiences, I'm wondering, is it a requirement that an artist actually needs to be part of a community to represent local experience in his or her work? And if you're not a part of that community, do you risk cultural appropriation in representing local experience? And honestly, what does it even mean at this point to be part of a community? Um, I'll ask you, Toby, to kick that off. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, cultural appropriation has been a uh, kind of hot button topic of recent. It's uh, yeah. banded around quite easily. Um, there was a, uh, a music star who I won't name mm -hmm. for various reasons, um, who's brought back a certain style of um, I guess music of black origin and he's been like uh, accused of cultural appropriation and there were many people who agreed that he'd been culturally appro appropriative mm -hmm. um, and some people who disagreed and felt that he'd, he'd been able to kind of bring new life into that and right. I feel like there is a difference between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. Right. Mm -hmm. right. um, the term cultural appropriation in my uh, experience tends to refer more to um, someone doing it without respect mm -hmm. for it, someone doing it without any um, respect for the people who kind of made it. So mm -hmm. uh, without going too controversial, it's yeah. often linked to kind of a con con uh, colonial yeah. um, kind That's of background. Um, whereas I feel that um, someone like myself or this artist mm -hmm. in particular, um, when you're kind of paying respect to something and you're homage. doing it because, yeah, you're paying homage to it, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's different. Yeah. Um, even my, my name, my online name is Toby Shinobi. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not Japanese, as yeah. you can see. <laughs> um, it's a name that kind of came about mm -hmm. because I was a fan of, uh, of a particular vi video game, which ah. is big at the time. Um, my surname is yeah. Shoni Barry, but it's, people find it very hard to pronounce. Right. And um, as an individual, as a, as a young child, big fan of Japanese culture, and it was just me paying respect to it, not taking it without respect for it. There's a lot of respect there. So I feel there's, you don't necessarily need to be part of a community yep. to, be, to, to pay respect and, or to, to pay homage to it. I feel that um, people are enriched by traveling to various different places um, or wanting to visit various places. And, and I feel there, there's a very um, clear delineation between cultural appreciation and oh, that's appropriation. Good. That's good, because I've been wondering if there is a clear delineation, so that's it's yeah, interesting I, to hear. Yeah, and, and there, there's, mm -hmm. there is always um, going to be different, differing views on that, yeah, because um, there's uh, intent versus how it's perceived. Mm -hmm. True. Um, but I, th I think um, a lot of people tend to go in um, a lot of people tend to jump on bandwagons. Mm -hmm. cultural, cultural appropriation is a very hot topic right now, and, and I feel a lot of people are just going to kind of throw that, yep. that term out there. And I think in many cases, people shouldn't be so quick to judge, and they should look mm -hmm. at the, the intention behind yeah. the person. Yeah. Does anybody else want to speak to this? I mean, I was going to say you also depend on what, uh, you know, what is the intended outcome of, you know, the, the reason why you even started yeah. to communicate with that specific community, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, you know, it depends, like, if you're trying to 
in a way modify uh, the way that these communities think ab about themselves, themselves and the way that they communicate yeah. uh, you know, to the world, mm -hmm. then I think it's a bit of a different story than perhaps uh, cultural appropriation or cultural you know, appreciation. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of looking at, you know, for me, for example, for the work that I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know, which has an intent that is to actually modify power structures okay. in okay. institutions, okay. it becomes very important to actually really affiliate yourself with these communities of scientists in my case, okay. and actually maintain that through the years. Yeah. And that is something that is quite, uh, you know, I mean, sociology has been around for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So if you think about sociologists like Bourdieu, for example, mm -hmm. you know, they speak about communities in the term of counterculture. Mm -hmm. So this notion of counterculture, which is a culture yeah. that is defined by uh, a culture, a community that is defined for uh, around a set of values, let's mm -hmm. say, then you're looking at different uh, elements that, that form that community. And he speak about three different uh, elements mm -hmm. that make that community. Uh, one is what he calls the social capital, uh, which is this notion of, you know, like, uh, are you a part of a membership? Are you all kind of like signing up to a form of music group or something like that? Then there is a cultural capital, you know, like what's actually make you, uh, what are the kind of the value that you share between each other? Mm -hmm. And then the economical capital. So in the case of, you know, and I will present it in a bit, okay. but in the case of an orchestra that is set at NASA, for example, mm -hmm. then it, it comes down to, you know, you're all wearing a patch. Mm -hmm. That patch makes you a part of that specific community and so on. So it really, you know, again, to respond to your question, I think it depends on, you know, do you want to be a part of that community or not? I mean, for me, it's essential yes. to actually really try to understand, you know, what makes that community yeah. who they are and also make sure that whatever you know the intervention you're going to do as a creative and so on is going to kind of maintain itself for a long time so you can actually really develop the change yeah. that you came in the first place to do and that takes time yeah. so you know maybe if this is a trend and that's maybe a question for you know like because trends is obviously something that could kind be of short -term. comes and go could every be, year. Could be short term, exactly. could be long term, and that's something else I kind of so want to explore here. Yeah. Is exactly. multi localism mm -hmm. something that actually should be expanding through, you know, like and, five, and, ten years? And to clarify, when we when we just use the term visual trends, it's a handy term because as we fork, basically what a trend is, it's not saying whether it's short term or long term, but we're saying we're seeing a trend in growing interest. So it could be something very long term that continues to evolve. And that's one of the reasons we're here today to talk about multilocalism, because we see it being something that will continue to evolve and to affect visual culture's evolution. And I think Rudy will be able to speak to that. And actually, our next question can actually speak to that a bit, um, because it's about evolution of visual culture. We've said that technology is the driving force behind multilocalism. Innovations in technology make global travel as well as information about virtually any culture available to a huge portion of the world. Yet technology is also responsible for the saturation of information and imagery in our lives and it's designed to be ubiquitous. So what will be the effect of this on our artistic and intellectual development? Do you think that technology can be seen as creative but also destructive. So creative in this amazing kind of multi-localism interest, but also destructive in perhaps the oversaturation and maybe kind of making imagery not resonant enough anymore, where people are just almost exhausted by the influx of Im constant imagery. Yeah, I think we have a lot of uh, <clears throat> inputs you know from you know everywhere now so if you look at the current generation mm -hmm. or the generation for, like I grew up mm -hmm. you know there was nearly no screens now the screens everywhere all the time and they have them all the all the time with yeah. them so there's a lot of uh, input from the outside world actually on everyone uh, which uh, I think from a creative perspective opens a lot of you know doors yeah. because technology uh, always comes up with new tools and uh, like now we can create virtual characters, as I will show later, uh, that are nearly as perfect as real, real world examples, or they can fit into real world, yeah? or they can be an overlap. So it's hard for uh, people sometimes already now to see the difference, and they think they are real. Yeah. Yeah? So um, I think uh, it creates um, a lot of opportunities for artists, but on the other hand, I think there's also an overload of, you know, information. Yeah. 
And uh, for especially for younger people, I think it's harder for them to see the blurred line. You know, <laughs> where's the blurred line? Where where do we go with this? Yeah. So, uh, and I think from a corporate perspective, there's lots of you know influence on that. How Absolutely. to influence in marketing? Absolutely. Yeah, people. But um, I'm very positive because in the end, you know, uh, as people, we always you know like see the blur and and yeah. and. and it's in the end, it's about connection, you know, yeah. visuals is about aesthetics. Yeah. And, you know, even in communities or how we express ourselves, mm -hmm. we use aesthetics actually to communicate to others. Mm -hmm. To connect. Yeah. To so, connect. and I think in the virtual world is going to be the same. So we're going to create more and more, you know, fantastic, uh, exuberant characters mm -hmm. because we like to connect to this yes. type of yes. uh, imagery. And does anybody else want to speak to that? Do you feel like technology is kind of gives and then takes <laughs> then takes away as you know do you feel like perhaps there is such an overload that viewers and audience might just check out at yeah. a certain point I, I feel that um, one one such technology is social media mm -hmm. and we're bombarded with so many images now yeah. um, um, in one respect the standard um, that for instance a content creator someone who produces photo and mm -hmm. video mm -hmm. um, uh, for a living um, the standard is, is raised really really high but at the same time, you have other platforms like social, um, sorry, other platforms like um, mm -hmm. Snapchat, where the bar is very, very low in terms of the video yeah. that you need to create yeah, and so absolutely. on and so forth. And then there's a kind of, I don't know if devolution is the word I want to use, but mm -hmm. um, a, a complete shift in culture. Whereas I grew up in a generation where being narcissistic or what I perceived to be narcissistic right. was a bad thing. Um, but we're now encouraged, um, we're now encouraged yeah. to put our faces on screen because people, like really said, um, mm -hmm. They really want to connect with yeah. with someone behind yeah. the person who's going on all of these journeys and experiences mm -hmm. and so That's on true. and so forth. It kind of personalizes it. Yeah. The selfie got, goes from narcissistic to personalizing. To self-promotion. Yeah. Well, yeah, and very much to self-promotion. Yeah, and, it, it, and, yeah. and for, for many people in the uh, yeah. career arena that I am in, yeah. they, they need to do that in order to it's kind of really... Required. Yeah, to, to, to stay uh, relevant in the game. Mm -hmm. They need to show who's behind the pictures. So I with all technology there's always going to be um, you know new advancements and then there's going to be people who use it for good and people who use it for not so good right. um, you know people always find a way to use some new technology for some sort of I don't know adult entertainment right. as one of the first things it's often mm -hmm. the thing that kind of yeah. also um, pushes technology forward um, but I feel that the developments in technology aren't going to stop they're always going to continue so we just have to accept it as it is what it is. It does destroy um, some forms of art. It makes it very easy to copy other forms of art yes, um, as well, but um, it also allows us to create new forms of art as well. Okay, so it really depends on the creative and the viewer, really. Yeah. It's, it just, that's what I'm hearing. It depends on the, the actual audience. Mm. Okay, great, you guys. I mean, before you sure. move to the next one, yes. I mean, I think it's also a question of education. I mean, I think you cannot remove that, like given mm -hmm. the fact that now you're bombarded with mm -hmm. images yes. from everywhere, yes. it comes down to also like figuring out what is quality and what is not quality to some extent. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think to me it really comes down to actually teaching also mm -hmm. what makes it that it's an interesting piece of work mm -hmm. and what sort of set of references that come up mm -hmm. with basically, yeah. as opposed to like, you know, it's just kind of like formulated out of you know, out of nowhere or, you know, it's just coming. But that has got value too, you know. I think mm -hmm. it's just a matter of like trying to figure, I think it comes down to how do you educate that new generation yeah. in terms of seeing what they should value in terms of like Where the critical value is. inputs, yeah. uh, you know, and, yeah. and so on. I think that is also, a, it's a very good point. A, you know, an important element yeah. moving forward with the education as yeah. part of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, wondering if, as people become more what we're calling multi-local during this time of globally disseminated imagery and we're identifying with more and more cultures, do we ultimately end up with a, homo a homogenous sense of self rather than a self that is connected to a region? And to develop that question more, um, historically many types of art have been very much connected to a place. Um, for example, the Dutch School of Painting is very much part of the Netherlands history. Um, much more recently, pop art is very much connected to New York City. So with this kind of multi-localism, uh, the population becoming more and more thinking of themselves as local and global citizens, does that art 
being connected to a specific place, is that becoming eradicated? I uh, think it creates sure. new art forms. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take, um, like, uh, like you said, this uh, traditional painting style mm -hmm. specific to a reason, uh, region. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go away, it's okay. it stays there. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the world will truly be homogenous since mm -hmm. Um, um, because of the earth, it's different in all the okay. places. Um, we have mountains, we have seas, and the climate, yeah, it doesn't mix together in a homogenous ball of so earth. So you think that they can continue side by side in other right. words? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, exactly. Like, as, like Percy said, mm -hmm. I think it's like, um, it's like 100% plus 100%, like it's, it's mixing cultures, mm -hmm. you don't erase things, you just transform it. Okay. Uh, and yeah, we talk about humans here, so it's compl mm -hmm. completely organic. Yeah. We, we can't yet uh, uh, anal analyze mm -hmm. the cycle we are in. I think it's, it's a true. kind of cir cycle. And mm -hmm. So you're saying it, it, time will tell and we can only look exactly. back with hindsight being 2020. Mm -hmm. It's hard to predict as much mm -hmm. as we try. Well, yeah. <coughs> to, to look at it from a, a certain lens, you know, sure. there's, there's that saying, uh, no idea is original. Mm -hmm. I think sure. we can look at it, well, obviously we're talking about visual trends here, but if we look at it from a po point of view of music, mm -hmm. um, hip hop culture has mm -hmm. been um, great at joining people all over the world into, into this massive community. Yeah. And it hasn't, um, I don't think it's been eradicated. Obviously it started off in like Brooklyn mm -hmm. or maybe even the Bronx, no, it's Brooklyn. Um, and it's now um, Japan, India, France, right. everywhere, yeah. and they all have their own versions of yeah. it. And um, I don't, I don't think it eradicates it at all. I think it just um, it adds new flavors. Inspires. Yeah. Inspires. Yeah. What was that, Mariana? Transforms. Transforms. In a way, yeah. That's great. It adapt, adapts to the culture. Yeah, that's it's, great. It goes to. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Great. It, but it's also interesting to think about it as a new opportunity too. I mean, mm -hmm. I think this notion of like being transnational, mm -hmm. the fact that yeah. you can kind of exist between, you know, in between nation states. Mm -hmm. I mean, perhaps we could say that borders have never been as closed as they are nowadays. Yeah. But at the same time, when it comes to culture, it's like, it's completely the opposite. Yeah. And that That's is, you know, if we were to look for an optimism in terms of, you know, the future of mm -hmm. the creative field, mm -hmm. I think we are in that phase where, you know, pretty much any, disciplines kind of exist in this transnational okay. form of, you know, it goes above and beyond. And I think that That's is great. really exciting to see, even though the internet is actually a gigantic cable uh, down in the ocean. I mean, this is the thing. I mean, we tend to forget that, yeah. but, uh, yeah. you know, there is a real, um, you know, physical, physical aspect, aspect to the aspect, internet. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. It's great. I think the, the internet creates, of course, you know, more homogeneity of like the, the rapidity of images that are right. circulating. Right. And so also the trends go a lot faster than, Much you know, faster. memes go now like in a split second. You yeah, know, they used to go really like really take faster. ages, you know, before even yeah. going to the other part of the ocean. But I, I still think that there's a, a big difference like with cities and how they have their own uh, development of creativity and new trends in, um, in the real world. Yeah. So, for example, in Istanbul now, there's a lot more spirituality there. Mm -hmm. It's not really visible online because mm -hmm. the people are less connected. Mm -hmm. But they also have a really mix, uh, a very nice mix of cultures and expression. Yes. But it's very interesting that, you know, I see it also as a trend that can mm -hmm. evolve from there. Mm -hmm. It's very early, early days, mm -hmm. but I see it as very different as any other city that I have lived before. Okay. So, yeah, Great. I believe in the real world, there's still like also like real trends developing in okay. local. Great. So now that we've talked a bit about different parts of how art and place are working through multi-localism. I'd love to turn this conversation over to each of the panelists and have you address how multi-localism is related to or affects your work, your audience. Toby? <coughs> Hi, so um, Toby. And um, <laughs> as I said, I'm here still to talk Toby. about- Still Toby. <laughs> yeah, still Toby. Um, <laughs> here to talk about uh, multi-localism and what it, I guess it means for me. Um, so just to give you a brief overview, I'll talk to you a little bit about my journey and um, how it's led me to be sat before you, and then um, I'll get into multilocalism. So I'm um, originally from London, as you can tell by my um, British accent. Um, I studied to be a lawyer, and um, that has played a part in the creative that I've become. I started shooting about five or six years ago, and it was around about the time I joined Instagram and grew a fairly large uh, social media following, 
and since then I worked on a number of different independent projects with a range of different clients. Um, I won't name drop here, but a lot of the big names that you've probably using right now in your back pockets um, or at home, I've, I've probably worked with them. Um, I've now moved from London to Chicago and um, I work for a large advertising agency as part of its creative arm to produce photo, video and provide ideas. Thanks. Um, so, multilocalism, what does it even mean? Um, I asked a few of my uh, industry friends to give me their definitions and uh, here's some of the things that they came back with. So the first uh, definition that was provided to me was uh, local beliefs that transcend geography and are similar in other local places. And of course, this definition makes sense in a very basic um, means. Um, the idea that cultural ideas or concepts um, can transcend um, the ge geographical area that they are. That makes sense in terms of uh, multilocalism. But I, I thought we could go a bit deeper. And um, this next definition, which was the ability to live independently of any city, of, sorry, independently of any specific city, um, in both a physical and cultural means, uh, embracing everywhere a person has traveled to, um, to the point that it becomes a part of who they are. Now this definition really resonated with me because I guess as a child, um, I lived in more than one place. So there was a period in my life where my parents were unfortunately getting divorced where I lived in Nigeria. And um, so I've lived in London and Nigeria and then in my adult life having lived in um, London and Chicago, um, I find that yes, the experiences I have obviously shape um, who we are as people and, and me as a, as a creative. Um, I do feel specifically with regard to this definition as well, one of the reasons why it resonated with me is that um, I was very fortunate as a young child to be able to travel to various places. And from a psychological point of view, I've always felt that um, just from a basic view of traveling from the UK to the US and seeing that they drive on a different side of the road over there, it's very um, uh, key to opening one's mind to see that there's no right or wrong, but there is different ways of doing things in different regions. And it just, as a very basic um, signal to, to anyone, to just step out and realize that, oh, there's, there's more than one way to do something. It's been very key to my, my, my existence as, as a person. The next definition is uh, when I travel, I want to be local and doing what locals do as opposed to the basic touristic points of view. And um, it seems that many people want tourism without the tourists, um, which is interesting to me. Um, <laughs> this, this does um, make sense in terms of a definition for uh, multilocalism. Um, you want to be able to have that authentic point of view. You want to be able to get off the beaten path and see um, the real thing rather than looking at the cookie cutter postcard images that you see. So if you go to London and you see Tower Bridge and the red buses, it's like, okay, cool, I've seen that before. You can relate to that, but what's Shoreditch about? What's Camden about? What's, what's the nitty gritty? What do the locals do? What's mm -hmm. key to this that I can take? Um, and that local knowledge has been invaluable to me as a creative. Um, the next definition is kind of similar, so pictures of the same place um, from a local or native's point of view. Um, and again, this is uh, another recurring theme and it's about the authenticity um, that one gets when one travels to a new place. So this next definition um, is a bit of a mouthful, so bear with me. Um, diversity at a micro level rather than at a macro level that makes up for the total sum. It is analogous with how tech and data are enabling the targeting of individuals at a psychographic level rather than an, at a demographic level. And it's giving us a richer picture um, as to how um, to experience new places. Um, so what this definition meant for me was um, images and or experiences which relate to um, why we want to um, go to certain places as opposed to just who might visit those places. Yeah? That's really interesting. Um, and then the, um, the next one was um, celebrating multiple cultures of a certain locality and making a movement out of multiple local places and cultures. Again, certain themes reoccurring, um, but this time uh, more emphasis on um, the multiple locations. And then the final um, uh, one was globalization, which is a combination of the words global and localization, and the practice of conducting business um, according to both local and global considerations. Um, Yes, this is, uh, again, multilocalism multi um, rebranded. Um, I guess for me, multilocalism has been a form of currency. Um, and what I mean by that is um, 
when I go to a new place, I'm able to connect with um, a local or someone who respects my artwork, and I gave them my new perspective on something they see all the time, and they exchange for me um, this local knowledge, and I do the same for them when they come back. So that's how I've been able to be able to come and sit here in front of you, the, the creative that I am as a person. Um, I've been able to really push my photography, my creativity, my videography, my concepts and ideas because I'm a child of the world and a product of many environments as opposed to just the one. Um, and that's what multilocalism means to me. Great, thank you. Mariana. Uh, hi, so <laughs> I'm Mariana and I'm going to talk a bit about myself first so you know, you can know what I do. So. Um, um, I'm an illustrator and I work mostly in advertising with big companies, which I won't name to, <laughs> <laughs> because it's better not to. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I was born in Porto, Portugal, and raised there. And if you look at my passport, it's what it tells you, that I'm just from Porto, Portugal. <laughs> But since I was a kid, I was uh, able to travel everywhere in the world with my parents. And I think it's stick with me, like uh, I wanted to live abroad. When I, like, when I grew up, I want to go and see the world for myself and live in other places. So since I was 20, I just moved. And um, I since then lived in uh, France, Zurich, Tokyo, and now I live in the UK, in London. And I feel like those places are me. Those are my uh, it's places where I feel they are my home and where I feel a local, where I belong to. So for me, that is what is being multilocal. Places that I feel at home. And um, those are my localities. Those are places that shaped me and my experiences there. So yes, I'm multilocal and I'm part of the world, I think. and. Um, um, Japan has a big influence on me. Is one of the uh, Tokyo is one of the cities that stick with me the most. Uh, it has a special place in my heart, so it influences me a lot. Like in every day, like rituals that I, I brought up with me. That sometimes uh, it's like people when you come at my home feel, oh, that's so funny. Like mm -hmm. since I moved to Japan, I when you enter my home, you have to take your shoes off, like those things that yeah. come with you from other places. And um, yeah, uh, it's, it's impossible not to be inspired by Japan. Mm -hmm. It's such a rich uh, culture and uh, inspires me a lot. I have a lot of respect for their culture, like their craftsmanship, their attention to detail is something that I try to bring into my work too. I'm really detail oriented, quite. So um, yeah, that's uh, mm, and I like how everything there has a purpose and a meaning. I, it's chaos when you look first at it, but when you pass that, you can see everything makes sense. Um, so um, how much is your work influenced by Japan? It's always hard to answer that question because yeah. people, s people who know where I live, always try. Oh, do you feel like your work? You can see Portugal in your work, or you can see right. Japan. I think it's <laughs> especially funny. because yeah. mainly my work, the theme you can see more is nature. Okay. So nature, it's Where it's not it. the same everywhere, but you know yeah. what I mean. So it's difficult to see like Portugal. You can sense like Japan. I think this mm -hmm. one that you guys are seeing. Yeah. But even in your shirt, you can sense <laughs> yeah. Japan. Yeah. <laughs> so right. people, when look at this one, they know. It's Japan. They can yeah. feel and sense, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's always hard to like pinpoint. Oh yeah, this is definitely yeah. from Japan, and this is from Portugal, this is from England. Although your image choices for today, yeah, are, are. Japan because yeah. it's like it has a really yeah. it's a special place for me. <laughs> so it's uh, and it's the place that has influenced me a lot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sometimes when I have the I'm lucky enough to do pieces about Japan. Yeah, yeah people come <laughs> and ask me for it. That's right. Um, so yeah, Japan, uh, when you travel there, when you travel anywhere, basically, mm -hmm. you, um, you are open to new things. You see the places with different eyes mm -hmm. and um, you start notice like real mundane things. Like for example, in Japan, like the manholes are beautiful. Oh. They have each, each uh, lo local in Japan has a different manhole, like with the, like the castle, for example, for of that city or the bird that they love and is a piece of art and yeah. you start noticing those little things. Mm -hmm. And I think those things 
are your experiences and stay with you mm -hmm. and shape the way you see the, the, the city. Um, because nowadays you have like internet, you see everything, mm -hmm. and of course you feel it's familiar to you, but I think until you go there, you can see things with different eyes and really experience authenticity. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, you are more sens sensitive to other things and to the unfamiliar and you start respecting yeah. the other cultures and what it means to them, it, just because they are different and don't do th things in the same way as you do, doesn't mean they are, they are not correct, it's just, what they are and you have to try and understand that. Uh, so, um, um, it, it's once again, it's really hard not to be inspired by it. Mm -hmm. And um, when I created those two, two pieces, was like trying to put into images what I experienced in Japan. For example, uh, I like to create imaginary gardens. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you can see, of course, there's some uh, real things from nature, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't usually depict them as mm -hmm. in the natural world. I try to create other mm -hmm. uh, things. And um, I think that goes with uh, the way we ex experience things. Mm -hmm. So the way I look at things uh, makes me create those images. But maybe if you look at the same thing, you, you will create other things how we, we experience and what we feel at that moment. And then how, what we create personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. And uh, like, for example, this one of the geishas, it's, uh, I think it's a good metaphor for like, Japan is so loud and flashy and everything is going on when you arrive there. It's just mm -hmm. like, wow, this city is insane. But once you pass that, you can mm -hmm. see like the order in the chaos, the mm -hmm. attention to oh, detail. Nice. So I like to, mm -hmm. when I put uh, an image, I like people to go like, go into there and start seeing the little mm -hmm. I think Japan is a lot about that nice. and mm. it grows on you yeah. so yeah it's I think it's really different to live in a place and experience that place you and then, um, and then offer it up in your own yeah, work yeah, and I your own so. vision yeah great yeah. thank you I'm not trying like to uh, go for cultural appropriation it's just my appreciation how it makes me feel well that's 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 a nice nuance there the difference mm -hmm. between appropriation mm -hmm. and appreciation once again yeah yeah thank you You're Nelly Thank you so much. Okay, and bonjour. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, I should start with talking about multilocalism. I think my accent is uh, very much all about multilocalism <laughs> already. I mean, obviously sounding extremely French, even though I've been living in the UK for now 11 years. I mean, living in the UK, but living nowhere very much. I shall say. Uh, but uh, yes, so I run a studio uh, called Nelly Benayne Studios. It is in, uh, in London, but then very much I've been influenced by pretty much every single discipline. And I was saying a bit earlier that, you know, my dad is from Algeria, mm -hmm. my mom is from Armenia, I'm born in the south of France. Mm -hmm. But realistically, you know, now that you, mm -hmm. you know, asked me to think about multilocalism, then I started to think about it more in terms of disciplines, right? Mm -hmm. And language as well. I mean, my language is, uh, you know, as you can see, uh, you know, the phrasing and so on is, is very much influenced by all the places where I've been to. So I started studying medicine, actually, and luckily I didn't pursue that route because I think I would have probably killed a few people <laughs> if I actually <laughs> went uh, and did that. And then I went and moved into painting. This is not one of my paintings. This is one of Edward Munch mm. and then E.S. Turner. And actually, you know, I realize nowadays that, um, you know, that was my first studies, really. Mm. And I realized how much that has been of influence to the work and the practice mm. I am doing, because pretty much everything I'm doing when I design experience, so really large scale installation, mm. is to try to embed that kind of feeling that you might get in front of a painting mm. and the color palette of that painting into an actual experience. Mm. And then, you know, moving into that, Japan has been a massive influence <laughs> into my practice, too. You know, I was studying textiles as part of a textile, you know, BA. Mm -hmm. I eventually found my way through the boyfriend of a friend or whatever, you know, South of France is filled with incredible experience. And somehow on the top of a mountain, I met with this Japanese woman that invited me to come in Japan. Then I found my way there, working with a Japanese master, learning about making kimonos. And as you can see, my interpretation of kimono making, so they were teaching me the, the 
the kind of the traditional pattern making on kimonos. And this is the kind of design <laughs> yeah. that will come up with complete multilocalism, right? Mm -hmm. That is diff definitely not uh, <laughs> typical Japanese uh, pattern. <laughs> uh, and then moving on, you know, I found myself like, okay, I could have kept on going and doing kimonos in Japan. And then mm -hmm. eventually I, I was offered, I mean, I was looking for, you know, what will I do as my master? And I wasn't even thinking of doing a master at the time. But then this landed, you know, into my mailbox and that was called critical design. Now, critical design was invented in the UK in 1999 by someone called Professor Anthony Dunn and, uh, and his partner, you know, Fiona Rabi. And then they came up with this really interesting practice, which is to say that design is not there to solve problems, but design is there to actually like propose, you know, questions and kind of start to interrogate the future of technology. Now, that was a really unique, uh, you know, educative experience in a way. That, so for two years I was learning about you know, science, mm -hmm. politics and so on, and then eventually found my way to do a PhD in political philosophy, specializing in Anna Arendt with a political philosopher, where I started to look at the power of experiential practices in the context of politics and specifically in the context of the institution. So, you know, I am in a way, I mean, the, the response to that multilocalism to me is very much to do with uh, discipline. And that's very much reflected again into the way that I will think about jobs and work in a way where, you know, I speak a lot about total bombardment. So I don't have one job, but I have 15 jobs, <laughs> which means that, you know, I will work in the scientific realm. So I work at the city, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence institute, looking for form of life on other planets. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also work for a tech company, you know, that you can see here. Uh, I also find my way at the UN, you know, working on more the educative outlet uh, and then, you know, kind of like exist in all of these different places, do films and so on. And that is very much, you know, what I believe is the design of experience, which is a direct, you know, in a way, uh, response to multilocalism. It doesn't exist in one place or another. It can be pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that is very much true also from the fact that I live nowhere. I mean, I say my studio is in London, but very much I have no actual like base and uh, that kind of like got me to think about this and actually you were talking about multilocalism as in being simultaneously yes. and, you know in one place but at the same time yes. globally everywhere and that is to me this notion of multiple geographies mm -hmm. I responded to it with my doppelgangers <laughs> so I have like two people that look like me that go instead of me in different places so that means that we can basically invade uh, pretty <laughs> much you know the world and being at different places at the same time. So that's my direct answer to yeah. perhaps artificial intelligence, but in the physical yeah. uh, realm. So I was talking about colliding disciplines and a typical example of that in my practice is the International Space Orchestra, which is an orchestra composed of NASA scientists mm -hmm. and SETI Institute scientists. They all perform music together uh, and they always with an agenda which has to do with, uh, you know, the kind of the latest mission at NASA, but they always look at it on a critical manner. You know, what make it, what is interesting, why is it that and they sing it in a way in a very kind of tragic form <laughs> and coming back to the point I was making before you know this notion of counterculture and trying to figure out a way that this multilocalism or let's say this counterculture can exist within an institution you know through the use of music that you know you were mentioning I think music is a very powerful tool to actually appreciate that pluriculturality, you know, cultural element that can exist inside a federal agency, like a place like that, for example. Kind of cross-border resonance. Exactly. Yeah. And so International Space Orchestra is direct answer to that. And I was mentioning social capital, economical capital. This is to me the, you know, where you can assess the, perhaps the, the <laughs> long-term uh, plan of multilocalism is like, how can you embed that into the uh, agency or into an institution using sociological tool? Mm -hmm. This typically, for example, that's a response to perhaps a economical capital of Bourdieu, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, every single member of the orchestra get a patch every time they do a performance. Every year we perform, we've been going on for six years, going to be our six year anniversary this year. And this is a patch with Beck, for example, when they perform at the Davis Symphony Hall. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are getting better and better. Prodigy, uh, here at the Fillmore Theater, so they sing in punk, you know, they jump in the audience. <laughs> All of that is kind of like, again, making okay. them exist in completely different new environment. Uh, and then Sigoros, they even sing in Iceland, Every single language, I think wow. language is a very powerful tool as well to interrogate that question of multilocalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are the Hollywood ball becoming like proper rock stars.
star. Here they are, <laughs> our NASA scientists performing into one of the biggest stage. And then coming back to also multilocalism, like, and I'm going to wrap up there, but this notion of transnational education going across borders. So recently we launched last year the University of the Underground, which is a tuition-free university based in the basement of nightclubs, both in London and Amsterdam, that provide actual accredited uh, master program. Uh, and so you have both an educative structure and also a cultural institution that come out of it. They learn the design of experience, which in a nutshell is what I present today. And I'm going to stop here, but in terms of the future path <laughs> of multilocalism, let's consider outer space yes. multilocalism. I mean, mu outer space multilocalism, question for us perhaps, multilocalism, colonialism, is that the same format, uh, but just said in a much more, you know, perhaps aesthetical manner, but at the same time, isn't it what it is really, multilocalism? And so in a, in a way, this is very much relevant to outer space and how we think about outer space and the invasion of humanity into uh, this planet. This is called terraforming. That's actually the name of a science where we look at making planets look like Earth-like and actually feed them with bacteria that can grow oxygen so eventually the next generation of humans can live there. And the question of our latest project is actually, isn't it us becoming like Vikings, like we used to back in the years? Anyway, I'm going to stop here and as you can see, I can speak for hours. This is the way that we roll, you know, and here we go. We'll go in Antarctica, in Mexico and all of these places, Likan Karul, you know, also working with these incredible scientists all over the world to think about where the future of humanity might go and what might it look like. I'm going to stop here and hand over uh, to uh, Percy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Percy. Well, hi everyone, I'm Percy. <laughs> uh, it's very fascinating for me to hear all of your stories and where you've been to and the places you've traveled, and especially for you uh, being in three places at once. <laughs> I think it's very fascinating. Um, for me, I've been um, living almost all my life in Hamburg, Germany, but I want to talk a bit about my childhood and why I still consider myself to be multilocal. Mm -hmm. So my journey towards becoming a multilocal person hasn't always been rosy and happy. Um, when I was at the age of eight, I moved from China to um, Germany, Hamburg, and lived in a very suburban area, and uh, as you might no, um, there weren't a lot of Asians. I was the only Asian in my class, and they would ask me where I'm from or where I'm really from. And mm. <laughs> the teacher, whenever the teacher asked something related to Asia, so not only China, but generally in Asia, oh everyone gosh. would turn their head towards me, oh. expecting me to magically know everything there is to about Asia. So by then, uh, my nationality, or identity rather, was a myth to me. So I was born in China. Um, on my papers, it says I'm Chinese. But according to my daily rituals, mm. what I do every day, uh, I'm considered German. Yeah, mm. um, yeah that's um, when I really had the thought about the uh, concept of multilocalism. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, to fully understand the concept, I had to basically self-reflect. Mm -hmm. And uh, so why do I still consider myself to be multilocal? Uh, part of that is because of the city Hamburg. It has a long history of worldwide trading and uh, it attracts visitors and dreamers internationally mm -hmm. to come and stay and form layers on layers of cultural, um, multilocal culture. So um, yeah, that's uh, where my inspiration for the, the first image come from. So after I've thought more about multilocalism, I saw the city with, new, with a new eye almost. Um, when I walk through Hamburg, I can see its effect on the city everywhere, be it in fashion, advertisement, street performer, or architecture even. So the concept for this illustration um, comes from a garden within the city of Hamburg. It has uh, traditional Chinese elements. And I wanted to take that feeling, that atmosphere I got within the garden and amplify it to a really ridiculous okay. scale. So um, for that, I took an iconic building. Yeah, you've probably already seen it before, the Eiffel Tower, <laughs> and added probably. on um, some Chinese elements. 
And um, okay, could you oh, sure. shortly go back to? Sure. Yeah. I wanted to talk about um, our first question, to Bre oh, yeah. Brenda. You said about uh, is it cultural appropriation? Right. You see, so I've never been to Paris, and um, most of my life I stayed in Hamburg. So I basically took the first Google search image uh, <laughs> I found of both places and tried to combine it right. into a concept. So I can't say for myself it is authentic, but. Um, I think every experience is valid, so um, it is just my interpretation what um, uh, f what multilocalism on a big scale could look like. Yeah. So, yeah. This is a screenshot of a short film I worked on um, last year. Um, I, um, it's a good example for how multilocalism isn't always visual, how um, what impact it can have on the viewer. The story in this short film, um, it's about a boy, the one in red and with the cape. His name is Tarek, he's from Syria and he is now living in uh, Turkey. Mm -hmm. So each year on his mother's anniversary he gets, um, he goes into town and get her presents, but now living in a new city he has problems finding uh, his usual uh, presents for his mother and he travels in his imagination back to his hometown mm -hmm. and now the film becomes uh, in a literal sense multi-local because yeah, it's both city mixed into one mm -hmm. and with the help of uh, a girl he meets on the journey uh, they together still are, um, they accomplish the mission of getting the presents um, yeah now uh, unless um, mm -hmm. uh, sorry um, uh, unlike the first image, we had an awesome director for this short film. She's from Turkey, so we had um, in our every step we got confirmation that is, it is uh, very authentic. Mm -hmm. Like it's obviously very stylized. <laughs> the trees um, they don't look like this, but we um, mm -hmm. really took reference from the leaves and simplified s to create a stylized but still authentic okay. experience. And this short film was shown to um, both children, children um, from Syria and Turkey mm -hmm. to strengthen their friendship and bonds. That's great. Right. So it's a real connector between cultures. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Alec? Once again, uh, my name is Alex Schmidko. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can s hear, it's a pretty complicated name because my dad is Polish, my mom is French. And I, I think it was my first example of multilocalism. I remember asking my dad, Dad, do you think in French or in right. Polish? And in, he answered me like, it depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, now as a photographer, this is what I'm trying to do, like represent people and like think outside the box, even if I have this responsibility to portray people. Uh, about portraying someone's culture, I think uh, every interpretation can be interesting until it's made with respect and uh, sincerity. Uh, we have to keep in mind uh, uh, accreditation. I think it's a very mm -hmm. important part in, uh, in this topic. Uh, and we know better than anybody as artists mm -hmm. how important uh, accreditation yeah. is. So I think it's one of the main things. Um, I chose this image. This is an image of my uh, girlfriend. She's another uh, very interesting example of multilocalism in my life. She's from Congo and she used to live in Belgium. Uh, she was born in Germany and we met in France. So that's, <laughs> that's a lot uh, to say. Um, You're getting married in Marrakech. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, why I did this picture, I was first of all inspired by a Canadian artist mm -hmm. who tends to represent Afro-descendants in a like glory, glorious, mm -hmm. uh, magical Egyp Egyptian way, in a way. And uh, I don't, uh, I don't, know, I don't know why, but I, I felt. Uh, I felt her imagery. Uh, I was sensitive to it, even if I don't have any link to it. So I decided to present. Uh, she's a painter, 
uh, and, and I decided to represent this kind of aesthetics with photography. And um, it, uh, this photo represents a not so bright side of multilocalism, a kind of homesickness, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, those moments when people make you feel like you don't belong to this country, like it's written on my face mm -hmm. and uh, it will always be. Mm -hmm. And uh, it kind of asks, uh, is multilocalism having many homes or never feel at home, finally? So this is it. Um, same use, different style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this picture is part of a series called Mother Earth. Uh, the project is a subjective and spiritual metaphor and view of nature, its power, its marvelous beauty, mm -hmm. uh, in parallel with the, the beauty of women. <laughs> uh, even though I shot this in uh, Senegal or Mexico, Pink Lake, actually with North of France, and a bit of <laughs> Photoshop with this. Mm -hmm. But um, I like the fact like she had, uh, there's um, a mix of uh, different uh, elements. Uh, she had blonde braids, that's not common. Uh, she wore modern clothes, uh, like jeans, uh, urban outfit in a landscape. And it creates a, a feeling of something that's out of time and uh, they have no boundaries. Mm -hmm. So this is what I wanted to, exactly. to create. Great. Thank you. Rudy? Yes, yeah, so uh, I, am, um, I grew up like on the countryside and then I, I moved to Brussels and always lived in multicultural environments, mm -hmm. you know, uh, worked and lived most of my life with artists, designers, creatives, musicians. Mm -hmm. I lived in Barcelona 10 years, lived in Cambridge a couple of years, and now I live in Istanbul. So I think um, what is important is that um, multilocalism to me is a state of mind. You know, it's all about identity, self-expression, openness mm -hmm. yeah, to the world, to mm -hmm. new ideas, to new uh, adventures, connections. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also a lot about aesthetics, yeah, because aesthetics is not just a mind experience. Aesthetics is a body experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know now through neuroscience and mm -hmm. genetics that all, all our body cells get activated. Mm -hmm. Like when we meet certain type mm -hmm. of people, yeah. you know, we can get triggered or we can get, uh, we can not feel anything at all. Mm -hmm. Or we can just like have a great connection immediately. So I think the expression in fashion mm -hmm. and in art mm -hmm. helps to actually create that connection. Yeah. yeah? So yeah. that we actually express something that, that makes that connection. So as, as people move around now a lot uh, more uh, than they used to do, I know a lot of people that just decide, oh, I'm going to live a year in Lisbon, I'm going to move over there. So which was not something that I knew from when I was you know, younger. We just traveled somewhere. So now people go and live actually in places they can feel good. But I think the most important is that you, you feel good at home with yourself. <laughs> yeah? Because when you're good at home with yourself, you can live anywhere. Yeah? And if you're connected to your real values of what you want in your mm -hmm. life, whether it's nature, whether it's people, art, then you can feel home anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I choose this image of uh, Michele Sousa uh, to actually define where we go with multilocalism in the future, because mm -hmm. she is a virtual character. She's what we call a virtual influencer. <laughs> so she's created by an agency and um, she always actually acts in the real world. Yeah, she poses with real people. She poses in real life with real friends. Uh, she has a life that actually she goes to concerts. She poses with stars and she's actually dressed by Chanel by some brands already. Wow. Yeah, she just raised six million dollars yeah, to actually develop her character online. She got one million followers on Instagram in one year time. But I'm very interested in this, like the blur that is created because lots of the followers actually of her believe that she's real. That she's a real person. Yeah, she's a real person because the visual uh, tools and techniques get so real now that yeah. we can superimpose yeah. like virtual images on the real world. Yeah. And this is going to expand also. It's going to augment because we're going to uh, go into an augmented virtual reality, mixed reality where we can superimpose virtual images on glasses so we can literally walk the Ramblas and play a game of avatars, you know, with other people in our environment and yeah. connection or become our own avatar. And I think for artists, this is going to 
create a, a whole new area of, of renaissance, a whole new era of renaissance, because there's a lot of new tools. And with artificial intelligence also, we can create uh, lots of different images yeah, and, and, and entire different worlds. What is important for me is that, uh, and I think especially artists, that we always keep the human element. Yeah. Yeah? Because when we create these virtual characters, we can, we can create anything, you know, the good and the bad. I know a lot of people, I know just in the world at large, there's a lot of nervousness or suspicion yes. around AI or virtual reality, creating characters yes. that don't really exist as physical, yes. living, breathing beings. Yeah. And yet what you're saying is, is very much that it's just it's just fuel for creativity in a way. Yes. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, exactly. I think. But yeah. it's everything that we do is a choice. Okay. Yeah? So you know mm -hmm. we choose to create good characters or bad characters. Right. Right. So I think it's important that we stay connected to our real human values, mm -hmm. uh, creating this virtual world. You know, if the ones who have seen uh, Ready Player One, well, it's just a repetition of every old addiction that we have known for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's all ego. Uh, aggressiveness, lots of violence. So right. do you really want to live in that world? Then don't create it, right. you know? Right. But I think artists and especially creatives, yeah. designers, they are best connected to their humanity. So the mm -hmm. problem is not there. So the creative I think, expression is yes. what's going to, to lead. Yeah. 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 yeah, great. And there's going to be tons of possibilities. Also in 3D printing, there's now mm -hmm. already 3D printing in architecture that's actually created by artificial intel yeah. intelligence. So we will be able to create entire new forms and shapes of buildings and um, architecture, so it's going to be interesting. Very interesting. Well, thanks everybody. This was a really interesting conversation and a lot of great ideas and very different perspectives. And thanks everybody here live and on Facebook Live for um, attending. Thanks everybody.